Uh, and so, however uh, we enjoy these next two days, these two mornings together, that for me is a privilege and a blessing. It's always an encouragement to share with men and women whom God has called to be uh, preachers, teachers, enablers of others in the Word of God. It's a great thrill and a great pleasure. So I look forward to these two mornings, uh, as I hope you will, and I hope that we will go away at the end feeling that we're just a little bit better equipped and motivated to, to do that very task for God's glory. Now the theme, as you've seen, I'm quite sure, of our two mornings together is preaching from Old Testament law, uh, which is quite possibly one of the most neglected areas of the scripture we're preaching from. And I'm really quite surprised that there's so many people in the room who uh, feel that they want to come and even think about that subject, uh, because there are certain kinds of theology which say we shouldn't even do it at all, let alone uh, learn how to do it. Uh, and therefore it's encouraging to me that that's what you want to do. By the law, of course, uh, I'm meaning those first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy, which are referred to as the Torah in the Hebrew canon of Scripture, the law, the prophets, and the writings. I've been thinking mainly, of course, about what we might call the legislative parts of the law, those parts of the Torah, which are also what we would tend to call law, uh, Ten Commandments, the laws that were given to Israel. But we do need to remember that uh, for the Israelites in the Old Testament, the whole of this material was actually law, not uh, was the Torah, not just the Ten Commandments. Now you have uh, a, a book that's there with the handout notes in it, and I'm going to be following that through, not too slavishly, I hope, from time to time I might deviate and go off at the odd tangent. Um, as the Spirit leads, of course, Eric, uh, we wouldn't be other than led by the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, in these things, uh, or possibly just my imagination, or even a question or something that you might throw up from the floor. But uh, we'll certainly begin with those notes. So the first thing that I want really, well, let me say that what I'm planning to do, certainly this morning, tomorrow morning may be a little bit more uh, practical and um, methodological, but this morning I really wanted to think much more at the level of our fundamental assumptions our theological assumptions that underlie how and why we should use the Old Testament law as Christians. Uh, because obviously we won't do it unless we feel there's a good biblical theological reason why we should. And we may well do it uh, badly or uh, misleadingly if we don't have our assumptions and our foundations set for us by the scriptures themselves. So therefore I make no apology for this, I feel it's important that we should preach from the law of the Old Testament with theological integrity, just as important as when we preach from the Gospels or the Epistles with theological integrity, that we know what we're doing and why we're doing it. So these first three or four points that are on the sheet uh, that we're going to be looking at this morning are really at that level. We're talking about assumptions. At any rate, we're talking about my assumptions. Uh, they may not, in the end, be yours. I don't know. We may choose to have disagreements. That's open to us as Christians. Uh, we can disagree. We can have different points of view about our theology. But at any rate, what you're going to get is what I think. And <laughs> I'm afraid you're stuck with that for this morning, although you can disagree as you choose. So first of all, then, let me start off with my first major assumption, as you can see on the page there, which is that what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 and 16, very familiar words, applies just as much to the law of the Old Testament as to any of the rest of the Old Testament. Now you know what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16 because I dare say many of you have memorized it, learned it by heart uh, and taught it to others. Paul of course is talking to Timothy, a man who had a Jewish mother and a Gentile father and because of his Jewish mother and grandmother had been well taught in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we now call the Old Testament, but of course it wasn't yet called the Old Testament by uh, Paul and Timothy, it was just the Scriptures. And what Paul says to Timothy is, you know what you have learned, and those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in the Messiah Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and education and justice. 
should be another way of translating training in righteousness that just makes it perhaps a little bit sharper. So that the man or woman, because it can be either, the person, the man of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now that, I think, is a very classic text about the Scriptures. And of course, as I've said, when Paul wrote it, he was thinking of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, because the New Testament wasn't yet written. Well, bits of it were, because Paul had already done a few letters, uh, but certainly by this stage, the Gospels weren't written, uh, and we need to remember that uh, Jesus never read the New Testament, uh, and uh, Paul didn't read most of it except the bits that he wrote. So when he's talking here about the Scriptures, he means what we have in our Bible in the section before Matthew, the Old Testament Scriptures. What does he say about them? Well, he says, first of all, that they are effective to lead people to salvation through faith in the Messiah, as he himself had been doing for uh, the previous few decades of his ministry, which was leading people to faith and to salvation in the Messiah, Jesus, through the Scriptures of the Old Testament. It's worth remembering, isn't it, guys, that all the church planting that took place in the Old Testament Book of Acts was based on the Old Testament. I used to say sometimes to our students at All Nations Christian College, which is a college dedicated to training people for cross-cultural mission, and many of them were going out into church planting and evangelistic ministry, I'd say, supposing you had to go and plant churches with only the Old Testament. Try doing that. That's what Paul did. Uh, but he took people from the scriptures of the Old Testament and led them to salvation through faith in the Messiah Jesus. So that's an important reminder that the Old Testament is part of the scriptures of salvation. It teaches us about the ways of our saving God. And the language of salvation comes from the scriptures of the Old Testament. Secondly, he says, Paul, all scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God. It actually comes from, in a, in a spiritual, metaphorical sense, from the breath of God. Now, of course, God does not literally have breath. He doesn't literally have a mouth because he doesn't have a body. So what the metaphor is saying is that the words that we have in the scripture are as personally related to the mind and heart and thinking of God as our words are to the breath that we breathe. And so there's this direct link between the mind and the purpose of God and the words that are in the scripture. So the words of God then, the words of scripture carry the authority of God's inspiration but also the relevance of God's authority. So Paul says, not only inspired, but useful, says the NIV. Profitable, beneficial, relevant, as we might say. Relevant for the purposes of teaching and correction, and as we might call it, basically, ethical instruction. Training in righteousness, education for justice, teaching people how to live, in a way which is pleasing to God. So Paul then assumes both the divine origin of Scripture and the practical relevance of Scripture. That's what Paul says about the Scriptures of the Old Testament. It comes from God and it's relevant to us. Now Paul says that about the whole Scripture, meaning the whole Old Testament. Then my foundation plank for preaching from the Old Testament law is simply to take that at face value and say that's true. So the laws of God in Genesis to Deuteronomy are just as much inspired, authoritative and relevant to us as Christian believers as any other part of the Bible is. It seems to me very difficult uh, to accept those who want to argue that the Old Testament as a whole or the law in particular is somehow of no relevance any longer to Christians if one takes seriously what Paul says here. I find it hard to accept the kinds of theology which say that. So that's the first foundational point that I want to make around those, those few things. I'll, I'll continue with this point for a, for a little bit longer, but you can see that my conclusion in bold at the bottom of that line is, therefore, we need to preach the Old Testament law as part of the Word of God. Because it is. It's in the Word of God. God chose to leave it there, didn't drop it off, it wasn't excised by the apostles, it was left in the Scriptures, it's part of God's Word, and therefore it seems to me we are spiritually and morally bound to preach from it at some point or other in the course of our preaching and teaching ministry as Christian leaders and pastors. 
Another way of expressing this same point, and I'm not yet turning the page with you, I'm still on this area of the, uh, the theological assumptions that come out of 1 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3. Another way of expressing this would be to talk about the unity and continuity of the Scriptures. That is, between the Old and the New Testament. That's not quite there in your notes, but I felt I wanted to add it. Now, of course, I stand among New Testament believers as a New Testament Christian myself, as a believer in Jesus. And, of course, we know that there are areas of discontinuity and change between the revelation of God in the Old Testament and what we have in the New. Of course, I'm not trying to suggest that they're all just on the same flat level. But what I do want to argue, and I think I have good biblical grounds for this, is that there is an overarching unity within the whole biblical canon which is of greater hermeneutical significance than the different divisions and sections and eras from which the material comes. The comparison that I like to use sometimes to explain this is like a human life. I stand before you as Chris Wright. I've been Chris Wright for quite a long time, uh, 58 years now. Who am I? What am I? How would I describe to you the meaning of my life as a human person? Well, I had an infancy. I was a baby once. I had a childhood. I had teenage years. I was a young married man. I was a young father. I was a slightly older father and a grandfather. Uh, I've gone through different periods of life. Am I the same person? Yes and no. Obviously, at one level, I am the same person as I was when I was a child, and yet I hope in many other ways I'm not. Things have changed, history's moved on, etc. But what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me that in order to understand the wholeness of a human person, you have to see the totality of their life as a, an organic, continuous whole, and not just chop it up into little separate bits as if they had no connectedness with one another. That would seem to me to be a very foolish way of handling a human life or a human history. There are lots of different stages and eras of life, but there is a totality and a unity which eventually will make my whole life story the story of who I was eventually when I uh, was rather than am, I think you might say. Now it seems to me the same thing needs to be said about the Bible. Yes, we have here a story with different sections, different parts, spread out along a very long timeline within human history. But then we need to recognize that there is, behind this timeline of human history, a single purpose and plan of redemption in the mind and heart of God. There is a unity to God's purposes and God's plan and God's redemption, which transcends the historical particularity from which it comes and within which we have to read it. Now, we're fairly familiar with that at the level of redemption. That's to say, we know as Christians that we can look at our Bibles and we can see that there is both continuity and discontinuity between the Old and New Testament at the level of redemption. So, as Christians, we look back to the Exodus in the Old Testament and we know that we personally were not slaves in Egypt nor were any of our literal physical ancestors. As far as I know, there were no Malaysians or Chinese or Irish people slaves in Egypt with the Hebrews. So we were not part of that exodus. There's a discontinuity there between what happened in the Old Testament and those of us who stand on this side of the mission of the church in the New. And yet, of course, we know that spiritually speaking, the New Testament puts us right there and sees the same redeeming purpose of the same God whose Son died on the cross for our salvation. And so we can use, as the New Testament does, the story and the metaphors of Exodus as a way of describing our experience of salvation. This is part of our story. It's the story which uh, is at the roots of our story, and our story is bound up with it. So there's a discontinuity, and a continuity, historically and spiritually. 
Now, if that is so at the level of redemption, it seems to me to be very similar at the level of ethics and law. When we read the Old Testament law, we have the same kind of tension. So, for example, we might read, as we will do later, a law like Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, which tells the Israelites not to muzzle the ox when it's treading like the corn. Now, that comes from an agricultural society. You can still see that happening in many countries today. I witnessed it uh, uh, on a visit to Nepal once. You see an ox tethered to a pole uh, with a threshing sledge behind it, very heavy pieces of wood with stone in it, going round and round in circles, threshing uh, the corn or the wheat to chop off the, the grains from the stalks. And the law says, don't muzzle the ox, let it be open so that it can eat some of the food some of the corn that is threshing for you. That's the law. Now we might say, well, I haven't got an ox. I haven't got corn. I'm not a farmer. Uh, so this law doesn't apply to me. There's a discontinuity between what the law told the Israelites to do and my personal circumstances. So I don't feel bound or obliged or applied by that particular law. But does that mean that there's nothing at all that we can learn from that law? Well, not according to the Apostle Paul. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul takes that very same law, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 7 to 12, and he applies the principle of the law about oxen to Christian pastors and missionaries. Very appropriate application. <laughs> and he says, doesn't the law say the same thing? Then he quotes the law, and he says, Surely God says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, says Paul, this was written for us, because... And then he goes on to explain how it's the responsibilities of churches to make sure that they provide for their pastors and their missionaries, those who are providing the spiritual food for them, have the right to be fed and cared for. And Paul uses that law by cattle in the Old Testament and applies it to a situation in the New Testament. That's continuity. That's seeing something of the consistency of God and God's moral will and purpose and recognizing that within the law there are certain objectives and principles which can be applied in different circumstances. And we're going to pick that idea up later, probably tomorrow morning, uh, and look in more detail at how we could make that kind of transition there from laws which at first sight might seem to have no relevance to us at all, and yet see how can we take those laws and in the light of what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16, actually regard them as being relevant and useful for teaching and training and indeed for preaching from. So that's then my first larger point. Uh, I stand before you as someone who does not ask the question whether Old Testament law is relevant for Christians, but ask the question how is Old Testament law relevant for Christians? That's the way we need to. I take, I take it for granted. I take it as an axiom that all the scripture is relevant for us as Christian believers. The only question that remains then is how do we make it relevant for Christian believers? How do we preach it? How do we apply it? And that, I trust, is what we're here to do over these next few days. So let's move on then to my second major theme, and this will certainly occupy us for most of our first session up until our uh, very welcome tea break at some point uh, in the next hour or so. And you see that my heading there says that the law was founded on grace, or the priority of grace in our handling of Old Testament law. I have a feeling that this is almost the most important thing I'm going to want to say to you over these next two days, because in some respects uh, it runs counter to a lot of very popular Christian thinking uh, in, in Christian circles, for whom the very idea of grace and law are often seen as polar opposites, like the North and South Pole, they, they just never inhabit the same uh, theological discourse. And I want us to see with every uh, part of my being that I believe that the law, just as much as everything else in the Christian life and indeed in, in the world, that everything in the law flows from 
the grace of God, and it's found in the grace of God, and that is where we must start. The law was not given to be a means by which people could get salvation or earn grace from God. The law was given as a gift of grace to those whom God had already redeemed. Now it's at that point that we have to recognize the importance then of the narrative context of the law. You can see that as a bullet point uh, on that page. The importance of the narrative context of the law, that is the legislation parts of the law, within the Torah. In fact, this is why it's so important to recognize that what we call the law, and usually think of as laws, legislation, instructions, and so on, for the Old Testament Israelite was actually Torah and included not only the Ten Commandments and Leviticus and so on, but also included Genesis and the story of the Exodus and the story of the wilderness and the story of coming to the very edges of the Promised Land in Deuteronomy. So the narrative context in which the law is set, because that narrative, the narrative in which the law comes, is fundamentally a narrative of grace. It's the story of God's promise to Abraham, God's fulfillment of that promise in the rescue of the Israelites out of Egypt, God's compassion for suffering people, the people who were oppressed in Egypt. The Lord saw and heard and was concerned about what they were suffering in Exodus 1 and 2. And the Lord's justice Justice on their oppressors, God's judgment on the wickedness of Pharaoh and, and the Egyptians, by which therefore he vindicated those who were suffering and rescued them out of that uh, situation. The Lord's faithfulness, his promise, his compassion, his justice, and also, of course, his provision, because he had been leading them and guiding them through the wilderness, protecting them from their enemies and providing for their needs. Now it's in that context of that story of God's love and grace and redemption that the law is given. So you might want to look at Exodus chapter 19. Uh, this is a text which we'll probably come back to more than once in, uh, in our study. It's one of those pivotal texts, really, in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 19. The uh, reference that's given on your sheet there is verses 4 to 6, but it, it, it's worth, I think, really beginning at the start of the chapter, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, because it sets the historical context very clearly. This is in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you in eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, then, a lot of others points follow, which we pick up uh, in the next section. Then you will be a holy people, or a royal priesthood, a special possession, and so on. We'll come to the then later. But look what comes first. See, what is happening here is, I said this is a, a pivotal verse, and I meant that quite literally, because here in Exodus 19, verses 1 to 6, we have the pivot between the first half of the book of Exodus and the second half, because Exodus is about 40 chapters, and, uh, and here we are more or less in the middle. And up to this point, it's been the story of the Exodus. Suffering of the people of Egypt in Exodus 1. Uh, Moses' first attempt to get them out, which failed. Moses uh, in the wilderness, the call of Moses at the burning bush. Uh, the story of the plagues, and then the great deliverance, uh, the Passover. And finally they arrive at Mount Sinai. That's been the story so far. And what's coming after this in chapter 20, of course, is the giving of the Ten Commandments, followed by the Book of the Covenant, uh, 
laws which uh, are there, and then the building of the tabernacle, uh, right on through to the end of the book. And here in the middle is this verse, which is a kind of hinge between the story of redemption, rescue, the first half of the book, and the giving of the law and the covenant in the second half of the book. But which comes first? And the very obvious answer is, redemption comes first. There are 19 chapters of redemption before you get a single chapter of law. And as you know, I, I trust, when we seek to preach and teach from biblical books, we need to look at the structure of the book, uh, the context of the book, the way the book is shaped, just as much as the actual content of what the book says. And it seems to me that this is fundamentally important. You see, what has happened here is God has now got the Israelites to himself at last. Uh, for the last three months, you know, it's been a pretty crowded stage. All these plagues flying around, Moses and Pharaoh, uh, Red Sea, lack of water, all, all the sort of story has been pretty congested up to this point. But now Israel has reached Mount Sinai, God has got them to himself, and God wants to say something to these people to explain and interpret what they experienced and to give to them the implications of how they are now to live and what lies ahead. That's what we have in this text. And what's the first thing God says? The very first thing God says. He says, you have seen what I have done. The first thing God does is to point to his own action, his own redemption. And they couldn't really argue with that, could they? I mean, there might have been a few raised eyebrows when God said that he had brought them on eagles' wings to himself. I mean, they'd been tramping through the wilderness. They were all a bit tired. They got rather thirsty and a very grumbly bunch of people already. But they couldn't argue with the fact that three months to the day before this, they had been whipped and beaten and treated as slave labor in Egypt. That was their situation before. They were crying out to God because of hard labor and suffering and oppression and let's be frank, state-sponsored genocide. Because that's what was happening to them uh, and on the instructions of the, of the Pharaoh. So three months before, they were slaves. Now they are free. And God says, I done that. That was my work. You know it, you see what I have done. So God points them to his own redeeming love, faithfulness, and grace before he even speaks about the covenant of the law that he's going to make with these people. So grace, redemption comes first, law comes as a response to that. That's a very essential framework to have in mind as you look at the book of Exodus. But the next text which helps us to see it even more clearly is Deuteronomy chapter 6, the next bullet point uh, on your list. Because here, the question about the law is actually asked. And it's put in the mouth of a child, which is where all the best questions come from. So, you know, children are very good at asking very fine questions. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'm going to be preaching again on this this evening, so you forgive me if it gets a bit preachy now, uh, but I think it's a wonderful section. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20 says, In the future, that is, when you get into the land, when your son asks you, what is the meaning? of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that the Lord our God has commanded us. Commanded you, Father. Now, that question presupposes a family in which the law is being kept. You see, so what we have here is the assumption of an Israelite family which are being devout and observant and in which the father is instructing his family and his children to keep God's law, to live in the way that the law said. Uh, and in the context of that obedient family keeping God's law, the son comes along and says, Hey, Dad, what is all this? 
literally, the question is simply, what these laws, it, it, the NIV says, what is the meaning of, and that is getting a perfectly valid interpretive slant on it. But the, 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 the text just says, what is this law? Which could mean, what is the point of it? Or what is the reason why we must keep it? Or what is the purpose of keeping it? it? It's sort of open to a number of ways in which you could read the question. But it's a very fundamental question. Christians have been asking for 2,000 years. I mean, it goes right back to the New Testament. What's the point of the law? You know? And some people say, hey, we've got to keep it. We've got to do everything in it. Do the Judaizers uh, that we read about in the book of Acts. And others like Paul say, no, we're, we're freed from the burden of law and interpreting it in a different theological way. So this question, what is the law, is a very fundamental one. And here, right in the book of Deuteronomy, it's put in the mouth of the child and asked of the father. Dad, why do we keep all this law? What's the point of it? Now, I don't know what you would have done, but if I'd been the father, I would have jumped straight, really, to verse 24 and say, son, stop asking questions. God commanded us, we do it. Period. That's the best answer to give, isn't it? Why do we keep this law? Because God said so. It's God's law. What else do you do with it? But actually, that's not where the text goes first. When your son asks you, what is the meaning of the law? Verse 21, tell him the story. What story? The story of the Exodus. Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our very eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, from Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in here and to give us the land that he promised on oath to our forefathers. And therefore, implied, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God. You see the order? He wants to know the meaning of the law, tell him the story of salvation. It's fundamental, basic. The very meaning of the law is found within the gospel. The gospel in Old Testament terms meaning, of course, the good news of God's redemption of his people out of slavery in Egypt. That was the gospel in the Old Testament. The Exodus stands in the Old Testament as the equivalent redemptive act as is the cross and resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament. In fact, in Luke's Gospel, as you probably know, in Luke chapter 9, uh, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, talking with Moses and Elijah, what were they talking about? Luke says they were talking about the Exodus that Jesus was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. And the cross in the New Testament is actually portrayed as the exodus of God's people. So here's the exodus story, is the story of salvation, and the father says, son, the reason why we obey God's law is because God has redeemed us, God brought us out of Egypt, and therefore God commanded us these laws. Grace first, law second. Redemption first, obedience in response. And so he goes on, if you look at the same text, the Lord commanded us this so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Now, please, again, don't misunderstand that. We shouldn't read into that some concept of, quote, works righteousness, the great bogey of uh, sort of Protestant um, theology and uh, heckles and everything else. What the Father is clearly not saying to the Son is, if we will obey God's law, we can all get right with God and be justified by works and then go to heaven when we die. He's not talking about that at all. What the Father is saying is, look, Son, this is what God has done for us. God's righteousness has already been displayed in the justice of his judgment on Pharaoh and in his rescue of us out of slavery. That's God's righteousness. God's righteousness revealed in his salvific action for us, his redemption. 
That's God's righteousness. What's our righteousness? Our righteousness is to respond rightly to what God has done for us. Our righteousness is our appropriate, proper, righteous response to the saving righteousness of God. It's not something by which we deserve salvation or earn salvation. You can't, because it's already happened. And therefore, because God has saved us, we respond to Him in this way by obeying Him. That's the order. That's what makes this a grace-based righteousness. The righteousness of obedience in response to grace. That's the same form as you will find repeatedly in the Psalms. And I'll get you to look at one of the Psalms in a moment and possibly discuss it. That the righteousness of the psalmist is always founded upon the prior righteousness of God for your righteousness sake, as you will see. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 to 25. Now, what that then uh, inculcates is a motivation on keeping God's law which is closely linked to gratitude. As it says in your sheet, gratitude is a major motivation for obedience. The son says, why should we obey God's law? What's the meaning of God's law? And at least one commentator that I remember picks up on the fact that the father immediately talks about being slaves to Pharaoh in the past. And this commentator wonders if just perhaps there's a certain hint in the question of the son uh, as to why do we obey all this law as if there's a kind of feeling that we've somehow become slaves to the law. Uh, why do we do all this stuff? Why are we bound to all this law? And it's as if the father is saying, son, if you think this is slavery, you should have been in Egypt. You know? uh, this is obedience to God. But we used to be slaves to Pharaoh. Uh, and so there's that sense that because of what God has done for us, in rescuing us from that terrible position of slavery. Therefore, our obedience to God is a matter of gratitude. It's a response to what God has done for us. Now, some of you may be familiar with uh, the very fine books of John Piper, a very excellent Christian writer and author. Um, I've read some of them and uh, enjoy them very much. Uh, and, and uh, commend them to you, John Piper. He's written one book, which I'm sure some of you know, called Future Grace. Have you, have you, do you know that one? Some of you have seen it? I'm sure it's uh, in Eric's in the Evangel Bookshop. Um, or has been, it's not there still. And in that book, Future Grace, John Piper, quite rightly, points to the fact that, that with God, we are always being drawn forward uh, in the promises and the faithfulness of God. Uh, by looking on to, uh, to the reality of God's future grace. And so we're, we're drawn on uh, in our lives to Him. And he condemns what he calls the debtor's ethic. And in doing so, uh, questions gratitude as a sufficient motive for uh, obedience. Have some of you come across that? Um, and if you have, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you may see it when you read his book. And he says that gratitude is a very inadequate reason for moral obligation. He calls it the debtor's ethic. You know, he says that it's a bit like, uh, because you have done me a favor, I feel obliged then to do you a favor. I'm in your debt. And so I have to repay my debt to you by doing what you want. It's the kind of ethic of a debtor or a slave. Uh, and, and Piper said that's not uh, the attitude with which we respond to God. Uh, that somehow we can pay him back for what he did for us by being obedient. He says it's a very inferior and indeed uh, a quite wrong kind of attitude to have. Now, of course, I agree with Piper at that point. Uh, there is nothing uh, in biblical ethics which suggests that we can either deserve God's grace in advance or pay him back for his grace afterwards. We don't pay anything to God by our obedience. So if that's what we had in mind as a kind of gratitude ethic, that's a very poor, mean, uh, inadequate understanding of gratitude itself, it seems to 
But when the Bible talks about the grace of God which has been poured out upon us in redemption, it seems to me there is a perfectly right sense in which I say, God, you have done so much for me. I just want to live the way you want me to live. I want to respond to you out of gratitude. Not because I think I can earn or deserve or pay anything back, but just because I'm glad you did it. And so there's this response of loving, free gratitude out of which we then seek to obey God's law. Now it seems to me that that's a perfectly valid biblical motivation in spite of what uh, John Piper has to say in, in, in criticism of it. Uh, so that's just really a little aside because I know that John Piper's books are very popular and deservedly so. Uh, they're very good books to read and all. That's one point where I disagree with it. It's always good to read books critically and uh, sometimes disagree with the author. And you're perfectly free to do that with my books as well, uh, when you do. Now, if that's the case, that the law is given on the basis of the narrative of redemption, and obedience to the law is being motivated by response to redemption, can we illustrate that? Can we see it actually happening? And what I want to suggest uh, is to look at one or two verses, one or two actual laws, where you can see this happening. So you see that it gives some examples there, uh, and let's turn to them, and uh, I hope that you will observe within them this particular principle at work. So the first one then is Exodus chapter 23. This is in the context of the instructions that God gives to uh, the Israelite legal system. In fact, uh, Exodus chapter, three, ver chapter 23 verses 1 to 9 is all about court cases and the verses here are addressed to the different actors or participants in any court case. Uh, so the uh, first few verses, verses uh, 1 to 5, are all addressed to the witnesses in a court case, those who have to come along and give evidence. And it says, don't tell the wicked man, don't follow the crowd in doing wrong, don't give false testimony, don't just side with the crowd, don't show favoritism. Uh, and uh, then verse 4 is addressed, 4 and 5 is actually addressed to the participants in the case, those who are at law with each other. And it says, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to take it back to him. Now, the enemy there doesn't mean uh, an enemy of the country. It's not talking about some foreign enemy from Assyria or Egypt. I mean, what would his ox or donkey be doing straying in your field? Very unlikely. No, the enemy here means your enemy at law. Uh, the, the, the person with whom you're having a dispute. And uh, the law is basically saying, uh, just because you're having a court case with your brother, don't take it out of the animals. It's not their fault that you're having a court case. So uh, if his dots, uh, donkey or ox wanders off, make sure you take it back. Uh, or if it falls down under its load, just because it belongs to your enemy at court, don't leave it there. Just help the donkey up. Uh, okay, so that's to the participants. And then verses 6 to 9 are addressed to the judges, those who have to do the uh, judicial tasks, the elders in the community, and so they are told not to deny justice, uh, not to accept a bribe. And then verse 9, do not oppress an alien, the foreigner, the immigrant, the person who is not part of your ethnic community. Do not oppress him. Why not? Because you yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in Egypt. So the memory of Egypt and the memory of God's deliverance from Egypt is to affect not just your attitude to foreigners, but the way you behave towards them in court. In other words, the legal system here is being influenced and affected by the story of the Exodus and the redemption from it. That's that verse. Something very similar happens in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, which is a wonderful chapter of practical legislation, laws about all kinds of things in everyday social life. It's a wonderful chapter. Exodus, uh, Leviticus 19, 
when I get to the new creation and have a chance to talk with Moses, uh, I'm going to ask him why he left this chapter so late in the book. Uh, because didn't he realize nobody would ever get to this chapter? Uh, at least among Christians. Uh, because we all get stuck about chapter 3 and everybody doesn't give up and uh, move on. But this is a wonderful chapter. And here in chapter 19, verses uh, 33 to 36, you have that very similar law, when an alien lives with you in your land, do not ill treat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as you love yourself. Because you were aliens in Egypt, I am the Lord your God. You notice again the Egypt reference. And so this is not just talking about general legal practice, as in uh, Exodus 23 verse 9, this is talking about equality before the law for all ethnic communities. The alien who lives among you must be treated on the same legal footing as anybody else, any native-born Israelite. Now that's a remarkable law. In fact, it's way, way ahead still of many countries in our world today where different, different ethnic communities are treated with different degrees of discrimination in the law. And in Israel, a thousand years before Christ, three thousand years before today, this principle of equality before the law for all ethnic groups is actually being upheld. But you notice the theological basis on which it's being upheld, namely the Exodus. You are to love him as you love yourself. That is, love the alien as yourself. Now, we're all familiar with the earlier verses in this chapter, uh, in verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself. Why do we know that one? Because Jesus quoted it. Do you remember? In, in the Gospels. First commandment in the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second the greatest commandment of the law is like it, namely that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, we always say our Lord Jesus Christ commanded us these things. In fact, Jesus was just quoting from Old Testament law, from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So love your neighbor as yourself, fine, we can manage that. But here, balancing that at the end of the chapter, love the alien, the foreigner, as yourself. It's only one more step for Jesus to say love your enemy, as he did, of course, in Matthew's Gospel. And this too is motivated by Exodus. And finally, for this same dynamic at work, look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 to 15. We move from the law court to the uh, economics, the world of economics, of debt and debt slavery, and the various regulations that would have happened in the, in the seventh year. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 is all about the legislation for the seventh year of the sabbatical year and what was to happen in the land uh, and to debt and to uh, Hebrew slaves. And so the legislation from verse 12 onwards says this, if a fellow Hebrew, a man or a woman, sells himself to you, that's to say enters into your employment because of debt, and so the only thing he can do is actually sell you his labor, so he effectively becomes a bonded uh, laborer in your farm or vineyard or whatever else, and he's working off his debt by working for you. That's what's being described here. Then uh, he shall serve you for six years. So it's a kind of six-year contract uh, or a six-year uh, working down of the debt. The debt is scheduled to be paid off over six years of labor. That's basically what the law is saying. But in the seventh year, you must let him go free. Well, that's fine. That's what the original law had said, the original law of Exodus chapter 21. You read it there. That's what the law said. Work for six years, seventh year, let it go. But Deuteronomy adds to that all about generosity. When you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Jesus could have said that, but we did in some occasions. But it comes here in Deuteronomy. Give to him as God has blessed you. Give to who, by the way? The slave. The man who's been your slave for these last six years. Garland him. That's what it literally is. Verse 14, supply him liberally, says the NIV, rather prosaic. Uh, the literal Hebrew is a metaphor. It says, garland him. Put a garland around his neck of flocks, wine, and, uh, crops, and so on. 
give him a good redundancy package. Send him off with plenty so that he can start afresh. Because God has blessed you. But then look at verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. Couldn't be clearer, could it? Why must you be generous to somebody who's a slave? Because God is. How do you know God is generous to slaves? Because you were. And God delivered you out of Egypt. And so the experience and the historical memory of God's grace in redemption is what explicitly motivates this law. Obedience to this law, therefore, is dependent upon memory of the Exodus and of God's grace. Israelite behavior in the law courts, in the family, on the farm, in the debt market, and in economics, Israelite ethical behavior was to be in response to what they knew of God's grace in their own history. Now, one could go on illustrating that. I've given you three examples, but if you take time and study through the laws of the Old Testament, you will find this happening frequently. And so what that says to me then, uh, to draw this uh, particular part uh, to a kind of conclusion, at least temporary, is that if we are going to preach from the Old Testament law, as I hope we will, we must always do it on the foundation of God's grace. Otherwise, we may well fall into the kind of trap that Paul had to argue against in the New Testament, which is to turn the laws of God into legalism. That people are told that they have to do this and they have to do that in order for God to be pleased with them, in order to get to heaven or whatever other kind of sweeties we hold out before them uh, that might make them motivated to do it. That's legalism. That's obedience either out of threat or out of some reward or out of some earning of favor or blessing with God. That is not the foundation of the law of the Old Testament. It's based upon the grace of God. It's responding to God's grace first. So therefore, my kind of rule of thumb is that if I'm going to preach from anywhere in Exodus to Deuteronomy, I make sure that somewhere in the message I'm referring to the foundation on which this law rests, which is the story of the Exodus and the reality of God's saving grace, and then link that to the story of salvation in the New Testament. One of my favorite ways of doing that, of course, as I did last night, if you were here last night, uh, was to refer to, X to sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, where Peter, in verse 11 and 12, tells the Christian readers of his letter that they must live good lives. That's ethics. That's obedience. That, that's seeking to live in a way which is pleasing to God. But before he says that, before he tells them to live, to be obedient to what God wants, he tells them, he says, you are a people who have experienced God's grace. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. You are the people that God has called out of darkness into light. You've had your exodus experience. And so therefore we can say to Christians, look, we've had our exodus. Our exodus is Calvary. The cross of Christ, the blood of Christ, it's the Passover lamb who was slain for us. And we therefore know what it is to receive the grace of God and the salvation of God. Therefore, any obedience that we follow up with, molded and shaped by God's law and the revelation of God's law, must always be based on grace and in response to grace. Otherwise, we'll simply preach law in a way which leads people into bondage and into legalism. So preach it on the foundation of God's grace. In a moment, I'm just going to pause and give us a, a, a time for some discussion and some questions. But I thought it might be worth just uh, picking up on that other thing, which is uh, at the um, end after it says, always preach the Old Testament on the foundation of God's grace. It, it just touches on this theological aspect of the relationship between law and grace in the New Testament. Because, of course, some people uh, want to take a passage like where Paul says we are not under the law, and assume that that therefore means we never need to bother reading Genesis to Deuteronomy anymore. And somehow we're, we're all under grace, thank God, we can forget the Old Testament. 
um, and there are theological systems which even sort of make that assumption that somehow the Old Testament is irrelevant to us as Christians. Um, let's be a little bit more clear about that. Yes, of course, we know uh, that in Christ, in the Messiah Jesus, we are granted a covenant relationship with God uh, which is based upon the blood of Christ and upon His grace and upon our faith in Him. And in that sense, Christ is, as Paul put at the end of the law. We are not under the law in the sense that we are no longer bound by the law as a mark of our membership in the covenant. In the Old Testament, uh, the law was part of the identifying framework within which the Israelites lived. They were part of God's redeemed people, they were his covenant people, and obedience to the law was a form of responding to that covenant reality. You kept God's law and you were within the covenant. And Paul says, now we know that our membership is within the new covenant in Christ's blood. In that sense, we are not under the law as the ethnic Israelites were in the Old Testament. But still, he says, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, he says, I am not without the law and you Thomas he says we're not without law as if somehow the law of God has nothing to say to us anymore as if somehow the law could just be uh, deleted from the scriptures as of no relevance rather Paul says in Romans that the law is still the embodiment of truth and goodness it still reveals to us the character and the will and the moral requirements of God but now what happens is that because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, the righteous requirements of the law are fully met in us who live according to the Spirit. Let me read that to you again, just in case uh, you hadn't read it recently. It's Romans chapter 8. Paul says, yeah, there is now no condemnation for those who are in the Messiah Jesus, Christ Jesus. Because through the Messiah Jesus, incidentally I'm putting it that way because I think when Paul reverses the order from Jesus Christ to Christ Jesus, he means it. He is intentionally putting the Messiahship of Jesus first uh, so as to link us back to the Old Testament of Israel and to remind us that Jesus of Nazareth is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture, is the Messiah. So through the Messiah Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, in other words, it wasn't the law's fault that we are sinners, it's our fault that we are sinners. But what the law itself could not do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that, listen to this, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be, what, set aside and done away with and not bothered with anymore? No. Might be fully met in us. How? Because we live according, not according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. So life in the Spirit, life saved by the blood of Christ, is life without condemnation. But it's not life without law. It's life lived now in obedience to God, fulfilling what God wants to be done, fulfilling the demands of the law, not in legalistic, literalistic ticking off of boxes, I've done this, I've done that, I've done the other, but a life which is now lived in a way which is responding to God's grace in ethical obedience and in covenant relationship. So that's what I meant by that little paragraph at the end there of the section. And it's a way of trying to help us to see that although we don't preach the law as a legalistic foundation for salvation, because nobody ever got saved by keeping the law. That was not even true in Israel. Never intended to be that way. But we do preach the law as an appropriate response to the grace of God who has saved us in order to show Christians that they should live in a way that is pleasing to God. Now let me uh, ask you just to do a small exercise at this point in, in some discussion, because I thought if I just say at this point any questions, please, there might well be a profound silence. Um, so I thought I'll maybe get you talking first, just for a few minutes, 
and then we'd have a little bit of question and discussion uh, and so on. Why don't you turn to Psalm 119, which as you well know is a great psalm, about or at any rate it, it speaks in almost every verse about God's law or God's word or God's promise. The word of God, the law of God is repeatedly spoken about in Psalm 119. And I'm not going to suggest that you read right through. Um, but why don't you look at verse 145 and 146? Where the psalmist says, I call with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me, and I will keep your statutes. I wonder if you'd like to just discuss in little groups of three the significance of the order of those words in relation to what I've been saying about how salvation and grace comes first before obedience. What order is it in those verses? And similarly, look at the last closing verses of the psalm, verses 174 to 175. 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let me live so that I may praise you and may your law sustain me. What's going on there? Is this works righteousness? Yeah. Doesn't this man know that you don't get saved by keeping the law? Hasn't he read the Apostle Paul? What's going on in this verse? Can you, perhaps in the light of what I've been saying about grace and law and so on, uh, ask, was this man in Psalm 119 a legalist? Would the Apostle Paul have condemned him? Or has he got it the right way around? in terms of his understanding of grace and salvation and his obedience to God's law. And any other response that you might make. Now my suggestion is, um, I notice that at the tables, most of you are sitting in threes and threes, uh, if you're at a full table or a six. And so it occurs to me that, you know, three people can easily just, the either two turn into the middle. Uh, but if you're, a, you know, like here, you might want to join with this group of three. Uh, and just look at those verses, have a little bit of discussion uh, about anything that I've said for the next you know, five or ten minutes or so, and then for the last quarter of an hour before the tea break, we can come back and have some direct question, answer, interaction around these themes. Okay? You might like to stop the tape running at this point in time. Uh, 
what extent or if there is the reformation affecting the understanding of the laws. Second is just the understanding of definitely uh, that John Piper raised. Um, particularly in the culture, I think it's very the right thing, the normal, uh, common, uh, acceptable. Um, is Piper reacting? I read that, um, and I was quite sure how whether he was also thinking of um, you know, a lot of missionaries or, or Christian service. Well, because Christ has given his life for me, by for him. Uh, that would be uh, many missionary situation of ministry uh, proper. Whether Piper is uh, reacting in, in some extreme, uh, well, with some extreme form of response that seems to suggest that the kind of response is um, now not out of love or uh, is uh, out of obligation. Mm. Uh, and is such kind of obligation wrong in that sense? Thank you. Um, the first part of the question was uh, what about the Reformation and how it affected the understanding of law? Yes, I think clearly Luther uh, struggled with this and, and there's no doubt that the way Luther handled it is, is profoundly uh, influential uh, and he was uh, also working within his own cultural and religious context of, uh, of uh, medieval Europe and uh, the way in which the church had interpreted um, in, in many ways, Christian life and behavior simply is a way of shortening your time in purgatory and the indulgence controversy and all of that. And so a very strongly legalistic element built in. Um, Luther, of course, was an Old Testament lecturer. I uh, need to remember that. Um, he, he spent his time lecturing in the Old Testament. And it was when he was um, working on the Psalms that he began to puzzle over the meaning of the righteousness of God. Because uh, his understanding of righteousness uh, in Latin terms, of Eusitia, was simply the condemnatory justice of God by which he punished uh, the wrongdoers uh, and he could not grapple with this fact as Paul puts it in Romans that in the, in, the, uh, the, in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. How can it be? Because the righteousness of God is the condemnation of God. How is that in the gospel? It was when he was uh, reading, teaching, lecturing on uh, Psalms, I think in 1513, that he came again and again and again to this concept of uh, righteousness as that by which God saves people, not that by which he condemns them, which of course is much more prominent in the Old Testament. The righteousness of God in the Old Testament statistically is linked to God's saving action far more frequently than to his punitive judging action. So Luther then began to realize that righteousness is something which God does uh, in his saving work and that he does it in us through Christ and through faith and so he came to that understanding. Um, it seems to me that part of the problem then was that Luther went uh, beyond that in terms of uh, uh, a very negative attitude towards the law because of his extremely positive attitude to the grace of God, uh, emerging out of this deeply personal profound experience of salvation through uh, justification by grace, was that the law then became something that on, its only function is to drive you to the gospel. Um, uh, it condemns you, it slays you. So he takes some of that language of Paul. And uh, it's understandable that Luther did that, I think, um, given his personal experience. It's interesting that Calvin went somewhere beyond that next generation, of course, well, exactly next generation, but just slightly later. Um, because whereas Luther saw the law only as that which slays and condemns, uh, and therefore, you know, what the law prohibits, Calvin wanted to know what does the law promote? What is the positive, beneficial function of the law in a Christian life? Uh, it was called the third use of the law in, in, in those days. And Luther more or less denied that there was any such ethical use of the law. Although, curiously, he did use it in his catechism. Uh, so he could use the Ten Commandments to teach Christian children how to behave, uh, which may be a little bit inconsistent. Uh, whereas Calvin much more positively uh, said, what Christ does is not to deny the law, but to restore the law to its true integrity, and quoting uh, from Calvin. Um, in other words, Jesus shows the real meaning of what the law is there for, which is to enable those who are the redeemed covenant people of God to know how they should live. And so he therefore was able to find much more positive ways of using and applying God's law, uh, and wrote a very interesting commentary on the first four books of the Pentateuch. Uh, 
as sorting all the laws out in, in relation to the Ten Commandments and then seeing their, their ethical views. So the Reformation went in slightly different ways in relation to the law, uh, and, and we shouldn't think that it was a purely single way. The Lutheran way was one, uh, the more reformed way was another. Uh, your second question, uh, just trying to remember what it was. Oh yes, Piper and the gratitude thing. Um, I think that what Piper is saying is that there is a kind of debtor obligation mentality which you find in many cultures, and certainly I understand it's present within Asian cultures, that you are very, you're obligated to those who, who, who are kind to you. It becomes a, an obligation that you must repay, otherwise you lose face and you're very ashamed and everything else. So there's this sense of, it's not so much that I'm doing this because I really love you, but I'm doing this because if I don't, I'm gonna get ashamed, or my family will be, because I haven't done back to you what you did to me. And, and I think Piper is quite rightly saying that that's not uh, the way in which we respond to God's grace. Because yes, we are debtors to God's grace, we are debtor to mercy alone, the great hymn of uh, Augustus Toplady. But we, we, we are never repaying a debt to God in our obedience. We can't, we shouldn't even try. Um, so if, if one, if you take up your concept of, of missionaries and others who have uh, given their lives to God out of a sense of obligation because of what God has done for me, I would want to say, well, at one level, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that in itself is noble. It, it is saying, because of what Jesus did for me, I will give my whole life to him. I, you know, I, I don't see that there's any problem with that. But what I think Piper is saying is, if that then leads you into a kind of burden of depressed obligation, a kind of guilt complex in which I can never repay enough and so I'm always struggling to be obedient because I always feel that I'm an unworthy servant, I've never done enough for God, that can lead to a very unhealthy kind of, of Christian obligatedness. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I think of my dear mother and I feel that there was something of that in her that, that somehow, you know, she was a missionary, she did wonderful things, but she never felt really happy. There was always this feeling, you know, uh, I've never done enough, I'm unworthy. There was a kind of depression about this sense of obedience. Whereas I think what Piper is saying, and this is what I do agree with him, is that yes, we are grateful to the grace of God, but the grace of God is something which is always ahead of us. It's always there in the future. It, it, it's a great eternal fund of the faithfulness of God to his promise, which draws us forward into the joy uh, of the future grace of God in which we trust. And so we're always looking forward to the greater things that God has ahead. Uh, and, and, and we respond to His grace, not out of merely gratitude, but uh, out of the sense of trust in the promises of God which last for all eternity. So that just teases that out a little bit further, I think. Uh, and, and that's where I would agree with it, but I don't want to reject gratitude as a proper, valid, partial motivation for ethical obedience. Anything else? Other, other comments? Or questions? Or anything from that Psalm 119? Yes. Okay, here. I've got a question about righteousness. Um, you're talking from Deuteronomy 6 about uh, the Father telling us that uh, I'll be doing this, but our righteousness isn't to get to heaven by keeping laws and so on. It's just our correct response to the righteousness of God, uh, which makes sense in that passage. But I was thinking about what Paul was writing about righteousness in Romans. And in chapter 10, um, he says, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. And I thought what he was talking about here, uh, Paul was contrasting righteousness by words and righteousness by faith. But I'm not quite sure if that's necessarily correct. Now. But if, if that is, and that would suggest that there are some bits in the Old Testament where Moses is saying you, you should keep these laws for the sake of being right with God. And in fact, at the end of Deuteronomy, we've got these curses for distributions. So if they're saved initially by grace, well, that, that makes complete sense. But if they can lose that salvation by not being righteous, then there must be something about laws and righteousness somewhere. Like yes. Yeah. Like together. Thank you. You're, you're touching on a very profound point. Paul's handling of righteousness uh, in Romans 10 in relation to what I said about righteousness in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, 
The, the fascinating thing, of course, about Paul's argument here is that he's being scriptural on, scriptural on both sides of his argument. He quotes scripture both sides. Um, because, of course, Paul is arguing all the way through at a very profoundly exegetical level. Um, and so, uh, describing the righteousness by the law, the man who does these things will live by them. He's quoted from Leviticus 18, verse 5, I think it is. Um, uh, which is, again, based upon righteousness, which is the righteousness of, of those who have experienced redemption. It's not the righteousness by which you get saved. It's the righteousness by which you live. You live righteously by obeying God's law. Uh, God has saved you. Therefore, in order to remain within the sphere of, of salvation, of redemption, live righteously within that sphere. And that, of course, is by keeping the law. So law keeping is an obedient righteousness response to salvation. But when Paul comes to talk about the righteousness by faith, he then quotes from Deuteronomy. Essentially, he, he, he one quotes the Leviticus, one he quotes Deuteronomy. I don't think Paul is meaning here to set some kind of irreconcilable conflict. Uh, he's using scriptures in order ultimately, of course, to point to Christ, which he gets to in the very next verse. And to say that what uh, Christ has done to us uh, is to bring this reality of salvation down, as it were, into our lives in such a way that our obedience to God is an obedience lived within the sphere of salvation through Christ. Uh, it, it, it never was intended that we would get saved by keeping the law. Um, that's why in Galatians, Paul argues very clearly that the justification was always a matter of faith responding to grace and promise, which it was for Abraham, and the law came second, he says. So that passage in Galatians 3, um, that uh, you know, all his opponents were saying, what about Moses, what about Moses, what about circumcision, what about the law? And Paul says, excuse me, what about Abraham? And he goes back behind the law and says, the original sound saving promise of God is God made the promise, Abraham believed, and he was justified by his faith, and the law comes in next, not as a means of salvation, but as a response to it. Um, coming to your last part of your question, yes, of course, Deuteronomy 28 speaks about blessings and curses uh, in relation to obedience and disobedience. I think it's quite important here, though, uh, not to make those equivalent, as if to say that you deserve God's blessing by your obedience and you deserve the curses by disobedience. The second is true, the first is not. Um, you never deserve God's blessing by obedience. You enjoy God's blessings by obedience. God's blessings are intrinsic to the covenant. Blessing is written into the Abrahamic covenant three or four times. Blessing is the sphere of redemption. When you are redeemed by God and you respond to his promise, then you live within the sphere of God's blessing. And how do you stay within the sphere of God's blessing? By living the way God wants. So obedience to God is the way in which we enjoy and experience and perpetuate God's blessing. So that in Deuteronomy 26, the, uh, which I'm coming to on tomorrow evening, no, yeah, tomorrow evening in, in the preaching here. In Deuteronomy 26, the dynamic is very clear. The worshiper says, Lord, here I am with my offering because you brought me into this land, you gave me these wonderful blessings, and so now I, I respond to you. That's God's blessing. Then he said, Now, Lord, I have kept your law, uh, and I've done what you've asked, and I've given to the poor, and I'm keeping all your commandments. And then he said, Therefore, Lord, please bless me and my people and this land. Now, if you, if you separate that last bit of the chapter from the first bit, you could think this guy saying, Hey, God, you know, look, I obeyed, I've done all this, so please bless me. But that would be to misunderstand the chapter because he said, Lord, you have blessed me. Now I'm obeying you. Please go on blessing me. So it's a kind of dynamic cycle. But the cycle begins with the blessing of God and then flows through obedience back to renewed blessing. Whereas if you disobey and reject God's law, Deuteronomy 28, what happens effectively is that you're running into the electric fence surrounding the sphere of God's blessing. You're running out of the sphere of blessing into the realm of the world of curse, which is the world we live in. We live in a cursed earth. And so if you put yourself outside the sphere of God's blessing of salvation, you inevitably find yourself under God's curse, because the whole world is. 
And so the Israelites have to therefore recognize that if they persisted in a kind of congenital, generational, historical disobedience and rebellion against God, the time would eventually come when God would keep that threat as much as he kept his promises and bring upon them the curses that are written in Deuteronomy 28. Uh, and they did, they went into exile, uh, and they experienced those things. So that's just to try and put those chapters into, into a proper perspective. Uh, the Old Testament does not teach that you deserve God's blessing by righteousness. It teaches that God saves you, God blesses you, you respond in righteous living. And righteous living is the means of continuing to live before God. As Ezekiel says, you know, if you look at Ezekiel 18, um, you have this wonderful case study of the righteous man and who has a wicked son, who has a righteous grandson, and so it goes through the generations. And uh, the people thought, well, you know, the man who is the son of the wicked man should die for the sins of his father. And Ezekiel says, no, 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 it's the one who does the sinning is the one who's going to do the dying. In other words, God's punishment will be appropriate. And even if a wicked man turns from his wickedness, he shall live. This is the wonderful grace of God in, in, in uh, Ezekiel 18. And all the wicked things he has done will not be remembered against him. Pure gospel in Ezekiel 18. Uh, I, I love that verse. Because uh, the, the protest of the Israelites was, but he can't. He's wicked. He's been wicked. Surely God will punish him. Because there's no, if he repents and turns back to righteousness, then that purges the record. Repentance not only, as it were, deals with the past, it purges the record, and they'll not be remembered anymore. So that's the wonderful grace of God, even there in, in uh, Ezekiel 18. The long answer to a short question. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Um, actually, we should stop for tea. We're going to be more, we've got two days together, so we've got more time, but I think it's a tea break. Thanks. Now, it's always an annual problem when it comes to the tea break. Um, some of you have not seen one another for a long time. Uh, don't stand shaking hands in front of the third table uh, and catching up with old times. Please, please cooperate. Get your foot as quick as you can and move as far away from the table as you possibly can. There's over 100 people here and uh, we'll never get back in time if there is a traffic jam in front of the, uh, the food tables. There are two tables, one on the left here and one straight across. Uh, try and, and uh, tee yourselves out to these two places and pick up the food and then move well away from the tables so that others can make access. Now, if you didn't have your breakfast, don't treat this as a muck at the side. Uh, uh, be considerate. Remember that there are others coming, looking for food uh, after you. Shall we just give thanks for the food? I think, Father, we want to thank you for the fact that we uh, our, our daily needs are met by you. And as we take this food, we pray that we will do so with grateful hearts. And that you'll bless it to our body use and continue to